And so, uh, if you'll just read with me really quickly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus the cursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Go to the next slide for me, if you will. Are you back there? Yeah. There we go. For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to an, another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. God, thank You. Open up our ears, God. Open up our spirits and our minds. God, I pray this morning, Father, that You grant me a soft pillow to lay upon. And God, that You would literally use my voice as a mouthpiece of the heavens, God, to speak truth, to bring clarity, God, to a subject that creates division. God, thank you for this body of people. I thank you, God, for the gifts that are in their life. I thank you, God, that because of these days, God, gifts will spring forth from their life. And I pray your anointing on them in Jesus' name. I am going to, again, try to teach you and, uh, and, and not, uh, not preach as much this morning because it is, this is a very controversial subject. Let me first say concerning the gifts. Uh, you know, we, we believe, first of all, um, we believe in the full embodiment and empowerment of the spiritual gifts. I believe in every one of the gifts. And uh, we embrace them. We believe that gifts lie inside of every one of you. Uh, there is nobody in here that does not that does not have a, a, a powerful gift, a, a spiritual gift that has not been given by God for you to use for the purpose of your life. Every one of you are equipped in some way. You may not know it yet. You may not have discovered it yet. You may not have developed it yet. But everybody is carrying a gift uh, that can literally change lives in the kingdom. Okay? Every one of you, you need to know that now. You need to embrace that, that God loves you so much. Listen, how many of you have, have had children or you've got family that you, you're going to give a gift to at Christmas time? Amen. Who's, who's going to give a gift? Right? We like to give gifts to people that we love, man. And that, that principle was not instituted by Santa Claus. Come on. It was instituted by, by Daddy. That's right. You follow me? And so it would be foolish to think that, that because he loves us so much that he, did, he doesn't have a plan to give us gifts. That's right. He, he desires to give each of us gifts. And you, you are a recipient of one of those gifts. And so uh, I, I just want, want you to understand that. There, I'm not going to go through all of these things, but I do want to kind of point out a couple of them really quickly. We talk about one, first of all, called prophecy. All right. I'm just going to get into teaching. It ain't going to be a preaching thing this morning. We talk, uh, talk about prophecy. And sometimes it's very difficult for us to embrace prophecy because many of these gifts uh, become manipulated within church culture. And we develop a wrong principle or a wrong understanding of what spiritual gifts are or how they function or operate or what the truth behind them is because we've been shaped literally by the operation of church culture rather than the truth of the Word of God. And so I'll, I'll pick out one called prophecy. Many of us have got this picture that, that prophecy is this fortune telling, this foretelling operation. And, and we have so many people sometimes that have deemed themselves as a prophet or a prophetess without really being in, impressed by the Holy Spirit that that's their gift. And they use that in a sense that they can just stand up before people or run up to somebody and say, hey, I got a word for you. Right? Who's heard that? I got a word for you. God told me to tell you something. Let me tell you something. Now, I'm not telling you that, all, that it's all fake. I'm just telling you be careful. Right. Yeah. All right? Because one of the other powerful gifts that you need to understand is the discerning of spirits. And you need to be able to tell whether God's talking to you or whether it's the enemy. The enemy will clothe himself in what looks good. He'll clothe it. Right. Y'all see me getting on the edge here, right? <laughs> The enemy will attempt to clothe himself in the picture of, of, of God or in the picture of what's right. And don't, I tell you this all the time, the devil is, is just, he's this, he's a faker. Because he doesn't have the ability to operate in his own abilities, in his own understanding, in his own practices. He has to borrow the practices of God and attempt to manipulate them with his lies and deception. So in the same way, if God is going to deliver a word to you, if he's going to give you a word, and he may use it through the prophetic word, 
word of another person. Don't be foolish enough to think that if God is going to send a word through you by a person that the enemy won't try to send a word to you by a person. Okay? And so we have to be very wise. But prophecy actually means, it means proclaiming God's uh, truth or, or, or the, uh, being led by the inspiration of God to proclaim. All right? And so we, we have to be careful to realize that prophecy is, it can be something that maybe God is trying to speak into your future or into your life. Maybe he's trying to kind of read your mail where you're at right now and give you some instruction about what needs to change or needs to shape. Maybe it can even happen in the sense that God is giving uh, direction and foretell direction uh, on, uh, for mission and purpose to a, to a body. But, but prophecy is even so much more being able to powerfully proclaim the truth of God. All right. It's being able to be driven and led by the by by the inspiration of God and to be able to powerfully tell God's principles and God's mind to people. So I don't want you to be be fool. I'll give you this little nugget, and this little principle really quickly. We hear a lot in the Old Testament. If you've ever read the Old Testament, you see you got the major prophets and the minor prophets in the Old Testament. You follow me? And we hear about prophet this and prophet that in the Old Testament. And, and, and all of the kings had prophets standing beside them and had had seers or and priests standing beside them to give them direction from the Lord. But you don't hear too many people in the New Testament called a prophet. Right. Right. right? Why do we get so many people today to stand up and say, I'm a prophet. I'm a prophetess. <laughs> Let me tell you why. It's because the word, when you see a prophet communicating in the Old Testament, yes, he was foretelling something that had not yet been written because the scriptures had not been penned. And so he had to or had to deliver the mind of God. He had to hear and be inspired. The Bible teaches us that the books are, are that the, the word of God is the inspired word of God. And so these men in, in the correct definition of prophecy had to be inspired by God to deliver God's mind and God's truth and God's principles so that it could one day be recorded into what we have as scripture. And so we have a lot of Old Testament uh, leaders that, that, that spent time with God called prophets. But here's the thing. Let's fast forward and get to the New Testament a little bit and we hear less about a prophet because the scriptures have been pinned. There's no need now for me to, and, and God sealed it up, wrote it up, sealed it up, and said, this is my canonization of Scripture. This is it right here. 66 books is as far as it's going to get. There ain't no more to be added. I ain't trying to use the prophet Jason to go and write his first and second edition. This is done. 66 is done. 39 in the old, 27 in the new. I shut it down. None shall be added. None shall be taken away. You with me? Yeah. And so we don't have as much of the need of that, of that inspiration without, without foundation right. as we once had. We have foundation. You got to remember in the Old Testament men and women did not have access through the Spirit by the Spirit of God to God. And so there needed to be uh, somebody that proclaimed the truth of God or the mind of God to a nation or to a land to give direction, to give warning, to give instruction, whatever it may be. But guys, we have access by Jesus Christ now to the throne room of grace that I don't need a man or a woman to tell me what God thinks about me, what he believes about me and where he wants to send me. Are you with me? So just give you that little nugget about prophecy. So let me move on to the to the big one. OK. This, uh, what I want to, to, to talk with you about is really uh, one of the, probably one of the most controversial, uh, uh, I guess, gifts that has divided church um, over many decades. Um, and, and, and it's normally, you know, not communicated or taught properly, which has brought much confusion and frustration and division amongst church believers. I want to talk with you this morning about spiritual language. All right. I want to talk with you about tongues. Yeah. And uh, and again, I told you it's not something that's going to grow my church, but it's something that can grow you. And so uh, I want to that's what I want to talk to you about. There are doctrines and, and principles, denominations, sex groups, whatever you want to uh, want to call it, that, that teach that spiritual language or tongues aren't necessary or relevant for current times in our culture. And then there are also doctrines and groups and organizations and sex that teach that unless that there's the initial evidence 
of tongues that you do not have the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you right now that both of them are wrong. Okay? Both of them are wrong. Uh, and, and, and both of them are inaccurate because I believe they've held on to just what they've been foretold by a man or a woman before them, but they've never really dug in to understand what Scripture says because it begins to get very complex when even speaking about this one subject. Out of any of the other gifts, uh, God begins to use three, three different passages, three different chapters of Scripture just to discuss this one thing. And I'm going to do my best to sum it all up for you uh, in, in just a short time. And I will say this, if you have questions about this subject, even after I'm done today, you are free to email me, call me, come on a Wednesday night to discipleship, we can talk about it more, whatever. Be happy to, to bring any clarity that I can uh, to this thing. But both of these stances, whether you, they say that it's not accurate and it's not for today and it's just for them, or whether they tell you that you're, you don't even have the Holy Spirit of God unless you speak in tongues, both of them are foolish operation. They're both foolish thinking. How many of you guys, when you get sick, you want healing in your body? Amen. How many of you have prayed for healing in your body or have asked somebody to pray for healing in your body before? Right? How many of you, when you don't know which direction to take, are pray, praying for wisdom? That God would grant you wisdom in what direction to go in life? How many of you guys, when you're reading scripture, that you want knowledge, you want to have the clarity of the truth of the word of God? Right? We got so many that want that, okay? Uh, and, and, and how many of you guys, you, you like to be loved? You want love. You want truth. You want all these things. Here's what's interesting to me is that we can get sick and, and not have a problem calling out for the gift of healing, but for some reason we want to push away the gift of tongues. Right. How do I separate when God pulled this whole thing in, into a gift basket and we take out the apples that we don't like? No, no, he gave the basket. You might not eat of it, but he gave the basket. He shaped it. He formed it. He decorated it. He cellophaned it, and he gave it to you, and he said, this is what's included in my basket, and you can't add, and you can't take away. And so we, we have no problem sometimes seeking out the other things about who wants more faith, Amen. right? More confidence that God, how do we seek these other things, but we don't seek to understand the truth about language in the spiritual realm? I, 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 guys, I'm going to tell you what, above any of these others, it's a strategy of the enemy to break down the language between man and God or man and man. Uh, we, we, you know, we've been taught again about this, this, this whole, uh, this initial evidence thing. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and I grew up in, in a church where they told you that you didn't have the Holy Spirit unless you were talking in tongues. And I, and, and I remember not even having an authentic experience with God because it was forced upon me. That I was, I was carried to an altar in the middle of, uh, of, 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 uh, of revival services or whatever, 12 years old, and, and, and people are trying to shape my, guys, I'm going to tell you something. You need to think. Thank God. I'm, I'm going to thank God right now that he covered my mind because I had God, had literally God not had a covering over my mind. Your pastor would have been shaped by some wrong thinking 30 years ago yeah. and 20 years ago because I, I was taken in, in moments over and over and over again that, 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 that these revival moments. I was ushered to the front, whether it be ladies or men, and they'd have tons of them around you and they'd be lifting your arms and telling you got to do it like this and you got to operate it like that. And then they start just move your mouth and they get your chin and just start bobbing. And you're sitting there trying to figure out everything they're telling you and can't hear from God. And then that becomes our thinking about how God operates is that I'm being forced into something that I don't even yet understand and don't even know if it's authentic because God's not doing it to me. People are doing it to me. God literally, because I had been, been conditioned and shaped that way to properly integrate tongues into my life, God put me to sleep. And I woke up at 2.30 in the morning one morning just talking in tongues because I had, God literally had to put me to sleep to do work in my life so he could move me past the thinking that I had been conditioned in. All right? But from that moment on, it literally liberated me. Come on. And a few years back, God began talking to me and showing me about this scripture here because I had grown up in that circle. And guys, I'm not here to knock denominations and people. I just want to teach you the truth. That's all. All right. I just want to teach you the truth. And so, you know, we, we get this thinking that it's about this, uh, this, this, this initial evidence is about receiving the tongues and that you don't have the Holy Spirit. Has anybody ever heard that you don't have the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues? Right. How many of y'all, let me, I just want to be transparent with me. How many of you, have you, uh, of you guys that has hurt you? Come on now, just keep it there for a minute. That has hurt you. 
I'm here to tell you, and I'm sorry they've lied to you. And I'm sorry that they've hurt you. Because I believe it's a strategy of the enemy to try to keep you suppressed for what God wants to do in your life. I'm hoping that they can bring some liberation to you. If you'll give me a moment to do that. We were taught in John, in John chapter 20, I taught you, taught you guys in John chapter 20, uh, that there was a difference uh, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is received upon acceptance of Christ. Christ breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit. And then we see Jesus tell us, now wait a minute, I'm going to leave. And when I leave, I want you to hold up and wait in the upper room. And then I'm going to send the power from on high or the anointing of it. So there's a difference between the indwelling of it and, there's, and, and the anointing of it. Now the, the indwelling of it righteously positions you in the kingdom. It gets you back to a place that you're reconnected with God. It gets you back to a place that you have access and the ability to talk and to have a relationship with God. The anointing power of the Holy Spirit is so that you can do work and go out and begin to touch lives. Right. All right. One is meant for you. The other one is meant for y'all. Okay? And so if you have to begin to think like this and the understanding then that, that, that because there is a receiving of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 20 and then the anointing of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 that there must be a difference in the gifts of the tongues. It can't be the initial evidence. It can't be the initial evidence because John chapter 20 never told me when they received the Holy Spirit and Jesus breathed on them, did anybody say anything? That's right. That's good. That's good. Right? Yeah. So here's, here's problem number one, is that when they received the Holy Spirit, nobody said a word. Right. No, nah, I mean, they might have had fun and all that, but <laughs> it doesn't give us any evidence that there was any tongue spoken. We don't see it happen until the Bible teaches us in Acts chapter 2 that there were things, there were the, the cloven tongues of fire fell from the heavens and began to set on each one of them, right? All right, so Paul teaches us. Now watch, let me, let me show you another, uh, another to debunk this. That God distributes gifts according to his purpose. Now, I can't force you into what I want you to operate in. Right. If, not, if that be the case, it would be my purpose. It would be my will. And so as I'm trying to shove tongues into you or shouting into you or running into you or healing in, that's according to what I think you ought to operate in or what maybe what I'm, uh, what I'm uh, familiar with. And so I think you need to understand it the way I understand it. But God distributes gifts according to his purpose, not man's. And so then when he develops this purpose, he does this thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that he said, here's the thing. Gifts operate by one spirit for the profit of all. But the there are diversities in gifts. Differences in ministries. And here's how I begin to work. Because I do things according to my purpose for your life and my will for your life, then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give one. How many? One. Is that all? Wait, wait, wait. It doesn't say all there. It says what? One. One. Isn't that interesting to me? Then if the initial evidence then that somebody's got the Holy Spirit, it would tell us that all right there. That's right. That all. But it doesn't. It says one. But it's, he says, I'm going to distribute to this one because I know the plan for her life. I know where I'm sending her. I know where I'm, who I'm shaping her to be around. I know what I want to do with her. And because I know the plan, this is the gift I will give her. I know this one here, and I will give him one. He could give you multiple, but he guarantees he'll give you one. And he says, one, I will give the word of wisdom to another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same, to another the working of miracles, another prophecy, another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues. But he goes through and says another and another and another. He never says all. That's right. That's right. But one in the same spirit works all these things, right? Distributing to each one individually as he wills. Hmm. As he wills. All right. So now we got this thing and we realize that God distributes gifts by his spirit according to his purpose and his will. And that we can't force somebody into thinking the way that we want to think just so there's a familiarity with us or that we can have something that we can put down in our record book says that, oh, they got the Holy Ghost. Yeah, it was, 
They didn't catch that, did they? They didn't catch that. See, what y'all don't realize is in church, they count you whether you're there or not. If you're on the membership, but the attendance is 200 and they got a membership of 600, guess what? They count the membership. You with me? If, if, if somebody run down the hallway and they, they, that's, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, that's going in the record books. It's all about record keeping. Very little to do with empowering. You follow me? You see how we got mixed up in this thing? We chase people. We chase numbers and money. We don't chase gifts and power. God's presence. Anyway, so, uh, you know, it, it, he begins to tell us that he distributes according to each gift and, and that not everyone will operate in all these gifts in the outward manifestation of the spiritual gift that's intended to impact the lives of others. Let me say this. It makes no difference what gifts you have or if you uh, don't or, or what you don't have if you don't possess two things, love and truth. If you don't possess love and truth, all right, you can judge more by a person operating in the Holy Spirit if he possesses love and truth and not gifts. That's right. You follow me? Let me show you really quickly. Let's see here. How about, can you, I, I don't even know if I can pull this up. So how about go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for me. Let me just show y'all. Let me show you what the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit is. Okay? If you need, if you need proof, it says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Now, y'all, I, I want y'all to put that away for a minute and just re recognize that there's the tongues of men and angels. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay? Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not. Mm, I become as something that don't even act right. That's right. You follow me? How are you going to tell me then that the initial evidence of God's presence in your life is you speaking in tongues and you ain't even got the ability to love somebody? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Then you sound like a babbling idiot. You know why? Because you're seeking an emotional experience and you're not there to change anybody's life. But he said, here's the thing, is that if I have not love, I will come as sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And although I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries, all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. That's right. That's right. That's right. Though I bestow my goods to feed the poor and I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Yep. So I'm telling you right now then that the initial evidence of the Holy Spirit is not a gift. It's a principle. Right. It's a fruit. You follow me? Go to, uh, go to, go to, let's see. Go to 1 Corinthians, I mean, uh, yeah, 14 verse 1. You find that? Pursue love. Right? He look, he says, pursue love. That's right. Desire spiritual gifts. But especially that you may pray. He says, pursue love. Pursue love. That's right. That's right. Why? Because love go to is go to Galatians really quickly. Let me shape it this way. Let's see. Is it Galatians chapter five? For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. <laughs> what? But through love, serve one another. For all the law, is, all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, be, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, now watch. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. What breaks the law? What breaks the law? Love. Love. Love breaks the law, and it says, walk in the spirit, and you shall not be under the law. You shall not give in to the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Walk. How do I walk in the spirit? What's the initial evidence then that I'm walking in the spirit is that I'm loving. The initial evidence of, God, of God's spirit in my life is that I love one another. Can I tell you why? Listen. Love, love is a, it creates a gateway. The, the Bible it says pursue love and desire gifts. Why? Because love is the, the love is the first prerequisite. Love is the foundation. If I don't have love, who I am or what I can operate in or the anointing that I have it doesn't matter a hill of beans. Because I, I become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I look foolish. I can't. I'm not even operating the, the way that I'm built to operate. If I do not have love, that opens up the doorway for my gift to work. Amen. Amen. 
Who are the gifts for? It told us in 1 Corinthians that gifts are for the profit of which means then that the receiving of the Spirit is for me and righteously reorders me so that God can then grant me the authorization of the power so that I can use my gifts to multiply the kingdom. You follow me? The gifts are for you. My gift of healing or my gift of prophecy or my gift of, uh, of, of, of wisdom or knowledge or whatever it may be is for you. My gift to be able to preach is for you. It's not for me. Are you with me? It's for you. But if I don't love you first, what difference is it going to make when I stand up here and say? Love opens up the doorway and creates access for my gift to begin to work. My gift creates, like Bailey said a minute ago, my gift creates an awakening. My gift creates an awakening to bring evidence that the kingdom is here. Yep. And then through my ability to love and the power of the gifts working through me becomes the thing that we have to build our foundation upon. Gives me access to teach people the truth of God because it's the truth of God. Not, uh, watch this, not my gifts that will set people free. Right. Are you with me? The Bible says it's the truth that shall set you free. Mom. You with me? Well, I can't get you the truth unless I can love you and open up access to your life and use my gift to distribute knowledge or distribute healing. To meet your need first is what's going to grant me access to give you truth. Amen. I can't come slinging truth at you, telling you God's principles and this works and that don't work and go here and be that. But if you've got a need and I can love you and be drawn into you and I can meet that need with my gift, man, you will open up your life to me to the Deposit truth into you. God works in a matter of order. All right? And so he said, the initial evidence is love. Let me love. You know why? It tells me a lot when you come up to me and tell me you got a word, but you don't even love me. Come on. It tells me a lot when you want to pray for me, but you ain't even with me. Say it. Let's go now. Say it. You with me? Tells me a lot when you can dance and shout and do all this, but you ain't here when I need you. Hmm. I'm just talking to you right now. You follow me? Love. Love. Let's find a way to love people. Let's find a way to, to draw in. The, love will create that access for my gift to begin to work. You cannot produce, watch, you cannot produce works of the Spirit without walking in the Spirit. You with me? You can't produce works of the Spirit without first walking in the Spirit. How do I walk in the Spirit? By love. You know what it says? I can't walk in the Spirit unless it's by love. But I can't operate in my gifts of the Spirit without walking in the Spirit first. How am I going to give you my gift when I ain't even walking in the Spirit? I'm going to give you myself. And I'm going to leave you broken. I'm going to leave you hurt because I just gave you my anointing and not God's. I just gave you what I thought you wanted to have. But it says walk in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, the only way you can walk in the Spirit is by love. Man, uh, all right. Let me move on. Move on. Move on. <clears throat> all right. So love creates an opportunity. The gift creates an awakening. And the truth gives revelation. Okay? Now, I want to teach you about the relevancy and, and necessity of tongues and, 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 and in order that you can be able to, to, to understand this. Here's the thing. To be able to properly understand the operation of tongues, regardless of, 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 of the way I'm going to break it down in this definition, you have to keep in mind what I have attempted to teach you over and over again, that we operate in a kingdom. This isn't a religion, okay? This isn't just uh, uh, just a, 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 an aspect of culture. This is a kingdom, all right? And so you have to begin to approach everything, the principles, the gifts, everything by kingdom understanding. Are you following me? You can't look at it in a historical context, but you have to look in it from a governmental constitution standpoint. I'm talking to you about the kingdom. Tongues are a heavenly given language which provides communication between heaven and earth, okay? Provides communication between heaven and earth. We cannot continue to treat it as a religious issue when it's a governmental issue. All right? Watch. Through tongues, the governor, who's the governor? The Holy Spirit. Through tongues, the governor communicates our request to the king and the king's will back to us. Okay? All right. Now watch. In a government structure. Now think about it now where you live in the United States or even your neck of the woods or even the state you live in or the, na the nation you live in. Whatever it is, think about it from the standpoint of governmental concepts. Okay? Language is the primary and greatest manifestation of a nation's culture. 
You with me? It's the primary and the greatest manifestation of a nation's culture. It's extremely important as a nation because it's an identifier. And Matilda can talk to me right now and, and she'll do her best to talk to me in English, but I know she ain't from here. She's become a citizen of the U.S., but she was not born here. That was not her native tongue or her native dialect. It's an identifier that she is not, she was not born an American. She was born in, in Nigeria. Is that right? In Africa. So language, language is an identifier. It gives national identity. Would you agree with that? Yes. Language gives national identity. Okay? Now, come on. Let's just be real. If somebody's talking uh, Spanish, you're going to know, right? Right? Somebody's talking Creole, you're going to know where they come from, right? Y'all watch the Alabama LSU game. Coach Ogeron talks that Creole stuff. You know where he's from. Okay? Y'all, we even know it from a nation standpoint. If somebody talk, if somebody's from Boston, they sound a whole lot different than they're from Greenville. You with me? It's an identifier. Language is such a powerful tool. It's an identifier. And so culture is contained inside of language. Okay? Language begins to shape our culture. If, 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 if you, you and I can't speak the same language, we can never have the same culture. You with me? Uh, because we, we, can't, we can't communicate to one another. It's the key. Listen, the key to community is language. Or actually, let's say it like this. The key to community is communication. Right? right? It's communication. So would you tell me then that, that God is trying to create a community of believers, a body of believers, right? We can't become a community of believers unless we have communication. We can't become the image of God unless we have communication with God. All right, so there has to be a two-way communication uh, that identifies us as not being of the world, but in the world. Okay? All right. Now, if you, don't look, if you don't believe this, look at the moral fiber of our nation when, when cell phones were introduced, when smartphones were introduced. Now that Facebook's made its way in and Twitter and all these things, think about that. It's now driven our communication to be from a touchpad rather than with each other, and it has created divisions. It, I'm telling you what, you can laugh at me all you want to, but it is a strategy of the enemy to break down the relationship structure of communication between individuals. He knows how powerful powerful language is and will do whatever he can culturally to put in divisive tools that will keep us from communicating with each other. You can even say that you communicate through text, but I guarantee you, you've been in an argument through text you never would have been in had you could have been able to talk it out in person. Right? It's, it, think about it. What happens to a marriage if there's no communication? What happens to a, co a company if there's no communication? Tell me then how powerful communication is. Why would God not want to have communication, strategic communication with you? You with me? So it creates this national unity. And when a nation doesn't have a common language, the unity of the people uh, breaks down. It's the, it's the key to effective communication. It's impossible to communicate the value, the history, the needs, the desires of a nation and its leaders uh, and its citizens, if its citizens aren't able to effectively communicate and do it over and over through generations. Think about some of the stories you've learned about your own genealogy. They've been passed down from your dad or your granddad or your great granddad. You found out about your lineage and, and what happened with your ancestors because of stories that were told through common communication language. You with me? You have some sort of identity about where you came from because of communication. Right. That's how powerful this thing is. So we have to have this continual ability to, to be unified in, in communication. Language is the key component to a common heritage. It identifies the home country of those who speak it. Now, Bailey's going to go to London here in just a little bit, okay? England, all right? And she's going to get over there, and it's a given that at some point over there, she's going to run into somebody that talks like they from Greenville. <laughs> you with me? And guess what's going to happen? When she meets somebody in a foreign nation that talks like her, it's going to build an excitement because there's a relationship there that they understand where they came from. Right. I'm teaching you something right now. It's church, but you don't think it is. Yeah. All right? If any of y'all ever been to China or Germany or France or somewhere, the Netherlands, somewhere where they, they speak a completely different language than what we speak in the U.S.? Anybody ever been there? Have you ever run into somebody while you were there that spoke English? 
Is that not cool? Like you can strike up a conversation with them that you can't have with the, the local restauranteur. Man, where are you from? How long you been here? I know, I got family there. You'll have a 10, 15, 20 minute conversation because it identifies that you two came from the same place. And it builds a bond that nobody else in that nation can break. You with me? Y'all getting this? Y'all seeing how this is going to fall into some kingdom stuff? All right, so we have to have this, this common language. Now watch what happens when you get this breakdown in language. It, it, it's, it's, it's so powerful. The same principles concerning the power and the value of language have major implications for the kingdom culture on earth. Watch this. Let's go to Genesis 11 really quickly. Man, I have to do this again. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. Right? This is the Bible. Very early on. The whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Now let me just give you, let me, let me just give you an understanding. We're at the place now that man has been exiled from Eden. Right. Man has since then been deceived of the spirit or the ability to communicate properly with the values and the will of God. Right. In, in that broken communication with God, God ex exiled man out of Eden, out of his presence, and man began to develop his own, his own community or his own nation. He did it his way. He did it by his own tongue. He developed it the way he wanted to develop it. And so now we get the multiplication of people on earth that are unified by one language and one operation. It's one nation. Okay? It's just not God. Right. The whole earth had one language and one speech. They said, let's, have, let's, let's, uh, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had a brick for stone and they had an asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Watch. Let us build a tower to the heavens. Not because I want to seek God, but because I want to make myself famous. Yeah. Let us make a name for ourselves lest we be scattered abroad over the whole face of the earth. Watch. Go to the next one. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Did God build this tower? And the Lord said, indeed the people are one. God recognized their ability to unify and how powerful it was. And they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. And now watch this. God says this. Nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Look at how powerful they were because of a unified language. God says, I ain't even involved. And they can do whatever they set their mind to do. Come. Now watch. Watch how he begins to disrupt the process. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language. Mm. That they may not understand one another's speech. Why? Because if I can wreck their speech, they don't know how to build a wall. <laughs> if I can wreck their speech, there will be a fist fight for the day's done. <laughs> you watch this. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over all the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. God's method to weaken man was by disrupting their language. You with me? I'm going to have to find some way to shut this down and pick it up. Hmm. Man was, was disconnected from the Spirit of God. And communication between man and God could not happen, but man began to unite himself. It shows us, this passage of Scripture shows us the power, the power of language alone and the power of unity in language. They set out to build a tower that the Bible said, God himself said, would reach the heavens. Would reach the heavens because of a common language and nothing would be impossible for them. And their key to their ability to build the tower was a unified language. Because their pursuit was selfish, God said, I got I to change the game a little bit, man, and, and change their whole idea, and, 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 and I got to disrupt their language. And Babel actually means confusion. And from that moment, now, throughout the rest of civilization's history, man has operated with man out of confusion. Right. Think about that. Right. 
Think about that. Although you may go to your neighbor's house, you may drive down to the store, you may drive within the 3,000 miles of the coast of this nation and be able to talk to somebody, but you can't take a plane and hop just 1,000 miles down the road and talk to somebody like you can here. That's right. That's right. That's right. See, we have this small mind and it's just about us. God said, I built a world of my people. And at one point in time, they were unified by me and by my language. And they would be fruitful and they would multiply. And they would fill the earth and they would subdue it. And they would author my presence on earth, operating unified together by my spirit, by my language, by my presence, and by my power. This whole language thing, man, becomes so important because it literally has, has, has just confounded humanity uh, in, in, in all since the Genesis 11 and him breaking down the language barrier. But it was God's way of protecting us. It was God's way. Of, here's the thing is that we were trying to communicate ideas with each other without God's spirit. We would have developed our own purpose on earth absent of God's presence and God's purpose for our life. He just said that they could do anything they wanted to do. He said, so I've got to separate their language that I can, can keep them confused with each other until I can get the foundational factor back into them. And when I can get my spirit back into them, I can then reunify them for the kingdom message with a common language. Mm. Now, if God, so let me say this, and I'll, I'll shut it down here. Man, understand this. If the key to weakness is many languages, then the key to power is one. So where's the argument then that our English language is better than the Nigerian tongue? How is it that my down south English is better than Spanish? How do I take my earthly language then and lord it to be the one that unifies us all? I'm teaching you something right now. So if the key to weakness is many languages, then the key to power is one. My language, my culture's language is not the power. It's my spiritual language that becomes the unifier. So I have to begin to, to embrace the fact that God has a tongue and a native language for every person in his body. You have been listening to the Rejuvenate Church broadcast. If you shared in today's service with us, visit us at www.rejuvenatechurch.com and send us a message. We would love to hear from you. Rejuvenate Church invites you to be our guest if you're in the upstate of South Carolina. We are located in Anderson, South Carolina, inside the Anderson Mall across from Books A Million. Our service times are Sundays at 1045 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. For up-to-date information, visit our website or connect with us on social media. We are found on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Pastor Jason Wilson and Rejuvenate Church desire to bridge the gap that divides race, age, and economic status. We are transforming culture by engaging and shaping men and women through relationships and positive kingdom influences. Thank you for listening. We look forward to the opportunity to share with you again at Rejuvenate Church. <laughs>